the theory of man-made global warming. Is it right or is it wrong? Today, we have enough data to answer the question pretty much for sure. Hello, my name is Dr David Evans. I used to work for the Australian Greenhouse Office, now the Department of Climate Change, as their main modeler of carbon in Australia's biosphere from 1999 through 2005. I have six university degrees, including a PhD from Stanford University in electrical engineering. Electrical engineering is the area of human knowledge that knows most about feedbacks and about complex systems, which are very relevant, as we'll soon see. Let's define the issue. First of all, it has warmed over the last century. Secondly, CO2, carbon dioxide, is a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases act as a blanket around the world, keeping it warm. The more CO2 we emit, the thicker the blanket, the more warming there is. Yes, our carbon dioxide is causing global warming. But, this is a bit like a whodunit. There's a murder scene, you were at the scene, but does that make you guilty? How do we know it wasn't someone else? For the CO2, how do we know it was CO2 that caused the warming in the last century and not something else? You really can't get away from it. This is a question, a quantitative question about how much. The key question is how much warming does the rising CO2 level cause? If it's only an insignificant amount, then something else is mainly responsible. But if rising CO2 causes about the amount of warming we saw, then we know that's the main culprit. Scientists use climate models to estimate how much. Now the theory of man-made global warming is embodied in those climate models in two ways. First of all, in the climate models, CO2 is the only major source of warming. And secondly, the climate models omit nearly all the natural forces. So here's the test. If warming is due to man-made CO2, our climate models ought to be pretty good at predicting climate. On the other hand, to the extent that the warming is not due to CO2, our climate models will do a poor or fairly random job of predicting the climate. Let's check the climate models against the data. The climate models have been essentially the same now for 30 years. They follow the same back of the envelope calculation and they get much the same result. Sure, in the last 30 years there's been huge advances in computer power and the models do a lot more detailed calculation. But their sensitivity to CO2 has remained roughly constant through the last three decades. So it's fair to compare the predictions that were made two or three decades ago with what's happened subsequently, because the computer models, climate models, haven't really changed. What we're going to do is simply check the main predictions of the climate models against the best data we have. We're going to go empirical. Here's a warning. The data up next is impeccably sourced mainly from NASA. It's from our best instruments, largely from satellites and the Argo program. It's publicly available. You can download it yourself. And you've got to ask yourself as we go through this, is this data relevant? Because the mainstream news media have never published any of this data anywhere, ever. First, air temperature. The best source of measuring air temperature are satellites. That's because satellites measure the temperature of the air above the ground they do it all over all the land and all the ocean, except a little area near the poles. They're unbiased towards hot or cold. They do it 24-7, and they've been doing it since 1979. So any, when you want to know the air temperature after 1979, satellites are your best source. The other source are land thermometers, which have often been placed at specially warming locations, like next to air conditioners, or at airports, or at sewerage farms, or in funny places like that, or in big cities where you get urban heat. The results of those are suspect and corrupt. So we'll use the satellite air, air temperatures. The picture here is of the NASA Aqua satellite. Our data that we're going to show you comes from that satellite. The first prediction, the oldest prediction that I can't back out of and is fairly important, is the prediction that James Hansen made to the United States Congress in 1988, which started the political ball rolling. James Hansen is known as the father of global warming. He's the head of the GIS laboratory at NASA. And he, he made his prediction as three scenarios. He ran his climate model and got the three lines roughly shown here. Now that red line at the top, as we go from 1988 through, through to 2020, is what he thought would happen roughly if 
carbon emissions continued as business as usual, which is in fact what has subsequently happened. The orange one is a middling scenario, but what I want to draw your attention to is this green line. This is what he thought would happen if carbon emissions were cut back savagely starting in 1988, such that by the year 2000, the atmospheric carbon levels had stopped going up at all. There's Dr. Hansen giving his testimony for US Congress in 1988. There's the temperature data that has subsequently occurred from those NASA satellites. As you can see, it falls below the green line. So that tells you that the climate models overestimate the warming due to CO2 and don't really have a clue about how much warming or what's causing warming. They're saying it's due to CO2, but obviously it's not. That picture there is Dr. James Hansen in 2011 outside the White House being arrested at a demonstration against an oil pipeline. A more considered uh, prediction of air temperature came in the first IPCC assessment report in 1990. Here they did the right thing and they estimated trends. They didn't try to estimate the monthly up and down, they just said what the trend will be. And their best estimate of the trend was 0.3 degrees per decade, that's the orange line. They thought it might be as high as that or it might be as low as 0.2 degrees per decade. But that was the range, they said our CO2 is increasing. If we keep on putting out CO2, as in fact we did, the temperature trend should be within that range. Here's the actual data. It's been 20 years now, but the average rate of increase is definitely below the bottom of what the IPCC could be based on their climate models. Again, I think it's fair to conclude that the climate models have overestimated the temperature increases in the air. Let's turn to ocean temperatures. Oceans are very important because in the climate system they hold the vast bulk of the heat. Now, a curious factor about talking about ocean temperatures is that the data before 2003 is almost worthless. We sampled the ocean only along northern shipping, commercial shipping routes and only sporadically and only using buckets which we lowered into the ocean and measure the temperature of or XBT darts that went down to 700 metres trailing a cord behind them. They went down, they dropped fairly quickly so they never had time to equilibrate, uh, sorry, to get the right temperature to match up with the ocean temperature as they went down. There are huge uncertainties in the data and it doesn't cover most of the world's oceans which are in the southern hemisphere. But to rectify this problem, people constructed the Argo program. The Argo program went operational in mid-2003. In Argo, there are 3,000 floats that go around the world's oceans constantly. And every 10 days, each float, and a float is about 2 metres tall, it dives, duck dives down to about 2,000 metres, spends a few days down there to, to match up the temperatures to equilibrate and then it slowly rises to the surface measuring the temperature as it comes up and radios the results back via satellite to headquarters. So since mid-2003 for the first time we've had a handle on what ocean temperatures are doing. Here's what the climate models say the ocean temperatures should be doing. We're measuring ocean heat content here. It should be moving up at a fairly steady clip at about that rate. Here's what Argo said is actually happening. As you can see, since the beginning of mid-2003, the ocean temperatures have been essentially flat. Certainly they're not warming as fast as the climate models predicted. Sea levels confirm this picture. Now, sea levels are best measured looking down from space. We can do it really accurately and we can do it over the whole planet. This is ENVISAT. It's the newest satellite that's been up long enough to establish a trend and it's from the European Space Agency. ENVISAT, since 2002, say the sea levels have been doing this. Now, these results are without any model modelling adjustments. Normally when uh, sea levels are presented, they adjust them for various reasons due to models. These are the raw data, unadjusted. The blue spots are the actual readings, the red line is the seasonal variation you expect, and the blue line here is the rate of increase of the sea level worldwide. And that blue line is going up at around about a third of a millimetre per year, or about 3.3 centimetres per century. All right. Now that contrasts with the IPCC, who are saying it's about 26 to 59 centimetres per century, or Al Gore in his movie, who suggested it might be 20 feet and that half of Florida will be underwater. So these sea levels are confirming what Argo told us, that there isn't much warming going on in the ocean. 
Now I want to talk probably about the biggest bit of data of all, the most, the most consequential. And that's the atmospheric warming data. In particular, there's an atmospheric hotspot that's predicted by the climate models. All the climate models predict a warming in the atmosphere over the tropics at about 10 kilometres up. It's due to changes in clouds and humidity and it produces most of the warming in the climate models. As it happens, we've been measuring the temperature in different parts of the atmosphere since the 1960s using millions of weather balloons. Every day, twice a day, at 900 locations around the world, people release weather balloons like this one shown. They have a thermometer in them and a radio. They take the temperatures they ascend through the atmosphere and the radio sends back the information. So we've built up a pretty good picture. Now, the government climate scientists didn't release that data until 2006 and only did it then in a pretty obscure place. Here's why. Here are the diagrams showing on the left, reality, and on the right, what's in the climate models. Each of these diagrams works on the, on the vertical axis. This is in kilometres above sea level, zero to about 30 kilometres. And on the horizontal axis, in the middle we have the equator, on the left hand side we have uh, latitudes going north, up to 75 degrees north, 75 degrees south. Now, in the climate models, you have a big hotspot. See that red hotspot there? That's the hotspot. That's what all the climate models say is happening during a period of global warming. And the changes in clouds and humidity associated with that hotspot is what causes two-thirds of the warming in the climate models. Only one-third is directly due to CO2. But here's what happened in reality. There is no hotspot. None at all. So the climate models have it completely wrong. Another comparison. The outgoing radiation. The climate models predict that the warmer the surface of the Earth, the less heat is radiated into space on a weekly or monthly time scale. In the climate models, they trap heat very aggressively due to the clouds and humidity. And it's that trapping mechanism that, we're going to, that was missing in the hotspot and that's due to amplification. We're going to zoom in on it. Now, as it happens, we've been measuring the outgoing radiation of the planet since the mid-1980s using a series of NASA satellites called the Irby series. And there's a picture of one of the Irby satellites. In 2009, there was a major study that linked the changes in surface temperature with the changes in outgoing radiation on a weekly and monthly time scale. Here's what they found. Now, it's presented in a slightly complex fashion. There are 12 diagrams here. This one up here on the upper left is reality. This is what the Irby satellites measured. The other 11 are climate models. Notice the slope of the line. The slope of the line in the reality goes that way. The slope of the line in the other 11, the climate models, goes the other way. And each of these diagrams, the horizontal axis is changes in surface temperature, and the vertical axis is the change in the outgoing radiation. So in reality, as it gets hotter, we have more outgoing radiation. In the climate models, it's all the other way around. The Earth, in fact, gives off more heat when the surface is warmer. Surprise, surprise. But the climate models do the exact opposite because they trap heat too aggressively. So, let's conclude. Let's summarise what we've seen. The air temperatures from 1998, due to Dr. Hansen, even if we cut CO2 drastically, he still overestimated the temperature rise. The climate trends, air temperature trends since 1990, overestimated. The ocean temperatures, when we started measuring them properly in 2003, they've been flat. Climate models overestimated them too. The climate models predicted an atmospheric hotspot. There isn't one. The climate models get the direction of outgoing heat completely wrong. We've checked all the main predictions against our best and latest data from impeccable sources. The climate models got them all wrong. So, we can conclude from that that the climate models are doing a poor or random job at predicting the climate. From which we can conclude that the recent warming is not due to CO2. Remember, if CO2 was the main force in the temperature, the climate models would be doing a good job of prediction. You want to download the data and check for yourself or read more about this? Please go to my website, sciencespeak.com. And prominent on there is a paper called Climate Coup, the Science. It's written for lay people. You don't have to be a scientist to understand it. It's pretty simple, and it shows you how you can download the data yourself and check. Thank you.